welcome to the opening event of Reimagining Film Futures, Borderlands New Art Show. We're celebrating the opening room tonight with three lectures from very special guests. But before we get there, uh, I'd like to let Katie Morton, uh, the artist behind the show, say a few words. It's a good thing I'm wearing heels, otherwise I wouldn't reach this. <laughs> so, thank you all for coming. I just wanted to give a quick intro as to how this works. There's actually a contest. All of these paintings, since I moved back from China, I continued my series of small escapes. And I was looking for art historical parentage to look at for inspiration in terms of composition, color usage, narrative. And so I was talking to Lewis, and we were both like, wait a second, what has great atmospherics? Classic sci-fi dystopias. So, yay Smogscapes, yay Beijing. And so I didn't have Beijing at my beck and call, and so I started watching all these classic sci-fi films. And all of these are stills from films between, from, that were made between the 60s and the 80s. And if you can name all of the films in all 21 of these paintings and email me correctly the names, I will give you a free print of a painting of your choice. Oh, cool. So, totally worth it, right? Um, yeah, I think that's it. Feel free to ask me about any of the things after. Great, right, let's do that. <laughs> Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the night, Dr. Lewis Evans, <laughs> from New Stanford University of Pre-Crisis Studies, giving his lecture, What Was Art? A Forward-Looking Retrospective. <laughs> Dr. Truby, M. Feldman, M. Beats, and guests. Both contemporaries and visitors, thank you for having me here to speak today. I am Dr. Evans, an art historian from the new Stanford University of Pre-Crisis Studies, and this is a remarkable opportunity. Before the substance of my talk, I would like to give two brief prefatory remarks. First, I am a time traveler, or more accurately, my corporeal image is being projected to you from a location which may be fairly characterized as the future. The nature of this technology is such that cross-contamination between our times, including disease transmission, is quite impossible. So please do not be concerned. <laughs> Second, and finally, targeting the time projector is very difficult. I am only able to attend this show because several paintings from it were recovered in a waterproof safe in the dog patch bag. So a note to collectors in the audience, Please either invest in waterproof safes or help avert ecological catastrophe. <laughs> this concludes my two preparatory remarks. I will now begin the substance of my talk with its eponymous inquiry. What was art? For most of human history, the question has been an important philosophical one. Since the Pax Pox, it has become much more urgent. Any visitors from my time will be familiar with our precarious situation. For the locals, I will provide a brief summary. It is difficult in our time to understand how the one state came into being. The state destroyed all accurate records of its rise, and an attempt to travel to that moment would be to risk vivisection as a traitor. Therefore, I cannot describe in much detail how the fairly liberal and open society we presently enjoy devolved into tyranny. The brutal ecological collapse of the mid-21st century may have played a role. Please try to avoid both of these if possible. The one state ruled some area for an indeterminate length of time. Its records indicate that the area was the world, or perhaps the universe, and that the interval in question was somewhere between millennia and all time, but these estimates are not regarded as credible. <laughs> in its final days, the one state was wracked by rebellions. The state engaged in a wide range of tactics considered appropriate for such circumstances. They used dogs, they used probes, they used drones, they used big data, they used spies, <laughs> they used cops, they used intimidation, they used torment, they used torture, they used concentration camps. They used non-lethal crowd dispersal weapons. They used nerve gas. They used propaganda. They used snipers. They used bombs. And in its death throes, they left past tradition. In one final brilliant spasm, they released the Pax Pox. The Pax Pox is a genetically engineered retrovirus. It is airborne and extremely contagious. This is why I encouraged you not to worry about disease transmission earlier. 
and it rapidly infected the entire population. Physiological harm is minimal, but it inserts tailored gene sequences into key cells in the central nervous system. The purpose of these modifications was to produce a population that was simultaneously tractable and productive. The leaders of the one state did not want lobotomized subjects. They simply desired a population which would not attempt to rebel. Reason is necessary for the operation of complex machinery, and so the one state did not target reason. The passions are necessary to make decisions, and any society requires that a great number of decisions be made, and so the one state did not target passion. Even anger and a sense of justice are required to calibrate certain crucial social functions, and the one state preserved them. Instead, they took aim at the imaginative faculty. The political character of imagination is uniquely subversive. A rebel without imagination is a saboteur, an assassin, a looter. He may be ignored without serious consequences, found without difficulty, dissuaded through the simple application of pain, and shot without objection. A rebel with imagination is a revolutionary. She strategizes and inspires. If ignored, she raises a movement. If hunted, she cannot be found. If tortured, she will not recant. And if she is shot, war erupts. And this had, in fact, happened. And so the one state designed the Pax Pox, which cripples the neurological systems that produce creative thought, that imagine new worlds, and the one state released it. We do not know whether the leaders of the one state believed that the Pox would defeat the rebellion or ultimately released it as a final act of vengeance against those who would not bow to them. It is a moot question in any case. It was two days after we burned the Hall of Justice that I came down with the symptoms. Both the symptom set and the time of onset were largely typical. Sneezing, coughing, raised hives on the skin. I contracted a slight fever, an unusually severe reaction. And somewhere in that night, the change overtook me. Here's what it was like. A year before the revolution, I was placed in a re-education colony for subversive activity. My room was two meters by two meters at its base, and perhaps eight meters high. At the top of the room, far too far to climb, there was a skylight covered by a barred grate. Sometimes the lights in my room were on, and sometimes they were off. There was no pattern. But when the lights were off and the sun still high in the sky, I could look up to the skylight and see a small patch of blue or gray or yellow. And sometimes when the lights were off and it was night, I could see the stars. And then, at some point into my stay, without any warning, they closed a heavy metal door over the skylight. This is what the pox was like to me. I conceived of this analogy as the closing occurred. I would not have been able to otherwise. Because the pox did not simply disrupt the imaginative faculty as it pertained to politics and revolution. Instead, it wiped it out altogether. Before the revolution, I was an amateur semantic trader. The contemporary terminology would be poet. <laughs> the subversive activity for which I was relocated was to author and casually disseminate a poem entitled Ode to Three Daffodils Found in an Unauthorized Location. <laughs> it was the best piece I have ever written. It was not very good. Since the box, I have written no poems. More than that, I am no longer a poet. Nobody is. Since the pox, there has been no new art of any kind. And so, despite the state's collapse, the Pax Pox continues to imperil our freedom and our society. Our lack of creativity leaves us at constant risk of reflexively recreating the very tyranny our comrades die to overthrow and absolutely prevents us from exploring the novel social forms we dreamed of under the state's heel. To choose a concrete and minor example, it is extremely difficult for me to remember to refer to my academic cohort, really a small group of desperate people, intellectuals by necessity rather than inclination, as Stanford University, rather than an aesthetic indoctrination cohort. And the former name was only available to us as it came from the feckin' bubbling past. Updating the name to New Stanford University of Pre-Crisis Studies consumed the full imaginative faculties of a dear colleague of mine, and it is unlikely she will produce further creative works in her life. <laughs> the most novel piece of visual art produced in the past six years is upright stick figure in the lower left-hand portion of the picture plane, wow. produced by my colleague, Dr. Ejiofor. We have encouraged him to produce additional works, but each of his attempts had led to a duplication of the original, and the effort entails considerable psychic injury. <laughs> Other artworks of note are horizontal line and a slight incline, and five dots placed with no discernible pattern. <laughs> Dr. Pan has been unable to place her famous five dots in any other configuration of any pattern whatsoever. And Dr. Torres's recreations vary in their angle by no more than three degrees. <laughs> this list is comprehensive. No other visual artwork has been produced, and we are aware of no new creative writing, music, sculpture, or any other such project. Without imagination, we cannot form a new society. Without art, we have no culture. And though we cannot be certain, it seems increasingly likely, we are gripped by a growing conviction that a society without culture will die 
and our revolt against tyranny and our band of surviving revolutionaries will appear to history as merely a coda or component of the end of the world. This is the crisis we face. Without art in our present, we have no hope for our future. The title of this talk must be taken, therefore, not as the gracious introduction to educated exposition, but as an urgent and wounded plea. What was art? We need to know. Thank you. Finally, in service of this objective, I will be distributing a questionnaire to you. It asks a single question, what was art? Please answer creatively, unambiguously, and concisely. I will collect your answers and attempt to memorize them before the projection window closes and the lunch will be scored. I may share selected answers with the group here for collective edification. If you would like your answer to remain a secret, shared only with my doomed future, please indicate this by ticking the appropriate box if you want. Again, thank you. Um, while you work on your questionnaires, I, will t I do have time to take one or two questions anyone may have. All right, please fill out your questionnaires. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, next we have Breaking the Eye, Reverend Researcher and Renegade Ophthalmologist. Dr. Trevi shares her findings on how we aren't seeing what we think we're seeing, and how the building blocks of art can break down our vision. I had every intention of presenting myself professionally for this evening, but I'm afraid my work kept me. I was unable to break away from my efforts to reinvent the human eyeball and the experience of vision as we know it, to tend to the base needs of my vile body, or adhere to the rigorous and asinine presentation standards we humans have set in place for each other. All this is to say that I'm very excited to be here and share my findings with you. I have been subsisting on a year's worth of airplane peanuts. I found them in a bit of travel pack back at the lab. I am an ophthalmologist, an eye doctor, and a research scientist. I have been working in the field of experimental vision models for several years. You may be wondering why a scientist is speaking to you at your painting party. I will explain. I once attended a painting class with Ms. Morton. As she may not remember me, I was a recreational participant. I used to stop the pursuit as a professional endeavor, but was encouraged to enroll in order to connect with dormant creative impulses that could potentially propel my lab work into more challenging directions. I was skeptical, but here we are. <laughs> the instructor for this class was a ridiculous person. He made rotations among the easels, mumbling arbitrary syllables of disapproval. On occasion, this displeasure would erupt into didactic proclamations about how we weren't seeing what we needed to be seeing. He insisted that if you, if what you paint doesn't affect, doesn't affect your body, then it isn't worth your time. How you must ignore that disgusting pull to please others and dig into your body to pull out the truth to slap onto your canvas. How the world was full of garbage, and the only way to connect with anything that means anything in this sludge of our miserable, comfortable existence required an active practice of tuning your vision, looking at beyond what you see, to break open your eye. Of course I thought he was out of his mind. I'd seen 800 living human retinas, eye dilated pupils, and laser lenses. <laughs> What could this enraged dilettante know about vision that I didn't? Breaking one's eye seemed like the least helpful advice for any living thing endowed with the gift of sight in any film study, but there was something in his rage that made me suspect there was something profound in his madness. I regret to say it, but there has always been a part of me that has had difficulty finding the merit in Jackson Pollock's aggressive dribbles and Rothbard's brushy blocks of color. I, I felt the key to understanding what I was missing 
why I was unable to access this seemingly unique and enriching human experience could be found in this troubled man's wisdom. So I got to work. First, I explored the premise that destruction could lead to innovation. I had previously conceived the progression of human achievement as accumulated mass. Discoveries emerging from a layered foundation, Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Darwin, Mendel, Watson and Crick, etc. As I began to read more about art, I realized that, like science, each period is directly related to that which preceded it. Each wave of thought was born from the previous. However, this movement between periods in art is characterized by rejection rather than accumulation. Gilded Jesuses give way to pompous portraits, give way to women made of triangles, give way to squares. <laughs> Just squares. <laughs> Scholars claim these compositions, these meticulously rendered squares, have shaken off the burden of representation and symbolism, shaken off the evidence of the artist's creator so that we can focus our attention on the building blocks of art, reducing the image to its elemental parts to achieve something more pure and visceral. I saw a square. I was curious to know what this feeling was like, to see a piece of art and feel it in my body like the painting instructor wanted us to. I resolved to break open my eyes. In the lab, I have developed a number of prototypes, robotic implants that interfere with the connected channels between the image received by the eye and the processing centers of the brain. These processing centers are what give context to the images so that you are able to weave together your experience of the external world, recognize faces, remember associations, maintain a sense of balance and spatial awareness. My invention uses artificial microphones to apply pressure at very specific locations within the ocular cavity. This configuration of filaments redirects visual input so that it bypasses its usual path through the brain and its information synthesis and instead goes straight for the gut. <laughs> the implants are programmed to translate what you see on the canvas, the elements of art and principles of design and their supposed properties, the violent quality of the color red, the placid or grounding effect of the horizontal line into physical stimuli. The color red triggers your sympathetic nervous system so that you have an accelerated heart rate and sweaty palms. The horizontal line activates your parasympathetic nervous system and your sleep and calm. The implants have completely changed my life. I know what it is to feel part of it. To stand in the presence of that rock can be enveloped completely in color and its associated sensation. To look into the lumpy face of Van Gogh and vibrate with the energy of all those short diagonal brush strokes. <laughs> As I, absorbed Ms. As I will absorb Miss Morton's work this evening, do not be alarmed if you find me clutching my chest or reaching out to steady myself. Now I feel so deeply. I became so overwhelmed by beauty, so nauseous by ingenuity. I have been invented a way to be human. Thank you. Yeah. exploring the now banned genre that may have caused the apocalypse. <laughs> Time will tell. 
My subject today is a pre-priced genre of text commonly referred to as science fiction. Its genre incorporates many pre-digital texts, but the bulk of the preserved works can exist now in the University Bookware system. Berkeley Nabisco's collection is the foremost inside the quarantine zone, and anyone with a licensed neural integrator may examine it. It is from this collection that I have drawn my conclusions. The banning of genre fiction came as no surprise to academics who lived during crisis times. It followed naturally and logically, subsequent to the regime's outlawing of negative or critical representation of the state or its leaders. From there, what was once referred to as the right of free speech steadily eroded. The early crisis years saw the loss of commercially produced pornography, as well as most forms of immersive gaming. The blacklists of explicit material and those who produced it were even lauded in certain institutions as the work sought to represent a return to traditional values. The meaning of this term is nebulous, and its actual definition may be lost in history. <laughs> However, up until the third year of the crisis, science fiction was still produced. Some fragments exist in the final examples in our archive, dated just before the genre disappeared forever. The final iteration in the multimedia saga known as Star Wars, <laughs> titled Rogue One, exists as a series of corrupted digital film files in the archive today. Like the fragments here before you, from your time, it is difficult to ascertain whether that media depicts a future, a past, or an alternate past in the multiverse. What is clear is that science fiction served the purpose of imagining or creating a timeline other than the one the viewer and the artist lived in. It was a way of constructing the world along an alternate outline to ask the question, what if, and then answer it in a way that ultimately commented on the world as it was. It was this last function that fascinates me and forms the basis of my thesis. Although many academics believe that the band genres existed purely for pleasure and diversion, I maintain that each of these works contains some form of social commentary. Indeed, it was for this reason that science fiction may have been a contributing factor to the crisis itself. Before the destruction of genre, science fiction media had for a long time fixated on the end of the world. In some works, such as the mystifying and partially unreadable text known as Adventure Time, <laughs> the apocalypse was posed with a whimsical style. In others, such as the lesser-known Elysium or the Planet of the Apes saga, the futures were a thing to be feared. However, no matter what the tone of this media, it allowed audiences to envision the world. The world to come after some humiliating event. Science fiction of the apocalypse sought out the unmaking of the world in order to create space for it to be remade according to a new design. It was this that provided the regime with public affirmation it needed to enact sweeping changes in both governance and warfare. Voters inside the quarantine zone had been instructed by the social commentary of science fiction that only after the corrupt world had been demolished could a virtuous one rise. The virtues espoused by genre of science fiction include white supremacy, the primacy of the male gender, gender binary, the necessity of euthanizing the severely disabled, the exceptionalism of the nation formerly known as America, the intrinsic worth of warfare as a method of spreading and preserving one's culture, and the importance of space travel. <laughs> These norms emerged after a long cultural struggle wherein women and non-whites were permitted to publish and read in the genre. The period was brief, and we are only capable of locating those works in the canon through the remaining reviews and criticisms. The works themselves were expurgated while sometime before the crisis. The chilling irony is that the creators of science fiction media were in complete agreement with crisis era government. Their symbols were co-opted for propaganda. Captain America was a popular mascot for Dow Chemical long after the graphic novels that was created and were banned and destroyed. <laughs> Robocop's films were first banned and then eradicated when the crisis era government determined that they contained much too much screen time featuring non-white faces. Yet we've all seen him in Millie Police training and tourism videos. <laughs> Paul Atreides Bank is in fact named after an exceptional character from this genre, heavily associated with the riches of oil and spices for which the conglomerate is known. <laughs> Once the regime had sanitized these icons and made them into trademarks, they no longer held any value. And so they, like the subversive works of such lost and hardly known writers as the elusive Nello Hopkinson or Ted Chiang, were scrubbed from all drives, discs, clouds, and other driveware systems. It is my hope that some of these lost works still exist in your timeline, and the crisis can be averted if it exists for you. 
The Berkeley Nabisco Library is forever indebted to the work of Vertec Edison's Electronics Waste Collection Initiative for turning over all potentially readable media discovered on the western side of the quarantine zone for our skilled extraction and archiving. Most of what we find is the approved content of the former state, but there are some pre-crisis gems. The Schrodinger projector is an inexact machine, but the multiverse is always in motion and every decision we make can potentially destroy the connection between my timeline and yours. I see through the haze of our link-up that many of the works upon which you gaze tonight are unknown to me. If my optical implants are providing you with correct information, beyond them lie many texts that you may lay your hands on that I can only dream of seeing. I do not know if yours is a verse in which the crisis can be avoided, but if there are texts available to you in any medium that represent the work of diverse creators, seize it, propagate it, celebrate it. I hope that my verse is your verse, and that one of the choices you make will stop me from transmitting.
the strong. I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> I, this is a really bad Neil Gaiman parody, um, and so if he finds me, uh, lie to him about it. Um, Meg Ellison is older than Sin, and her heart can grow no darker. She wants to basically do it with the abyss. Every midwinter, an ancient evil with flesh of oak and eyes of undead suns pleads with her to bestride the world like a colossus, meeting out pleasure and pain and defiance of desert as a fundamental reputation of God. But each year, she's like, um, pass. And then <laughs> the day of her acceptance draws near, and there will be a wailing and a gnashing of teeth, like the opening bars of a really serious death metal track. Uh, more seriously, Meg is a high school dropout and a graduate of UC Berkeley. Her debut novel, Book of the Unnamed Midwife, won the 2014 Philip K. Dick Award. Um, no fallacies were harmed in the creation of this award. Um, <laughs> that was a lie. Uh, she lives in the San Francisco Bay Area and writes like she's running out of time. Meg, what are you doing? Will come out in spring And then the time, like the timestamp from the frames in the movie. So that should be helpful. And that's, yeah, thanks again. If you like these paintings, they are for sale. <laughs> Pay for them with American money, and you can put them on any surface, although, as previously mentioned, in a waterproof seat would be best. Uh, also, if you like the, the style, but you don't see what you want up there, talk to Katie because she does do commissions. And now applaud for her as though. <laughs> <laughs>